In this exclusive interview, we speak with Datuk Sri Nazir Raza on his latest book called What's in a Name, where it takes readers to the intersection between the world of politics and business in Malaysia over the past five decades. We speak on his relationship with his brother as well as the legacy of Tun Raza. Enjoy this conversation. Dato Sri Nazir uh, Raza, thank you for uh, taking the time to step into our very humble abode here uh, in Bukit Jalil. Um, very quickly reading through the book, I got about 20% or 30% into it. And um, I was actually uh, quite uh, uh, surprised at the frank and honest uh, way of you telling your side of the story. And uh, on this note, it's actually quite liberating for us uh, to see uh, that kind of frankness coming out. Um, if it's liberating for us, I'm sure it is as liberating for you as well. Uh, could you talk through us the emotions and perhaps some of the ideas that went through in you penning your thoughts uh, in writing this book? Thank you, Brian, and uh, thank you for having me. I think, you know, uh, the whole experience was uh, uh, cathartic and liberating. Um, you know, being able to look back uh, on events in your life, uh, to be able to kind of research it again, to be able to, you know, revisit uh, your, your, your thought process uh, and also uh, some of the facts surrounding it. Uh, I find that, I found that uh, um, very useful um, and um, um, very calming in a way uh, because you know, my, my, my life uh, changed quite considerably mm. um, over the last few years and, 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 you know, you question whether you, you did the right thing and whether uh, you should have gone another way and so on. So I found that very, very, very helpful. And I think um, I'd advise uh, anyone uh, who is in a position to tell an interesting story to do it uh, because, you know, I think that um, future generations need to uh, learn uh, from other people's uh, experiences, good or bad. Um, and I think we owe duty to the future, uh, as it were. And I always felt a little bit um, um, sad that my father never had the time uh, mm. to pen uh, his own uh, thoughts and uh, uh, ideas for future generations. Do you feel that this is more of an extension of your father's legacy? In you writing this book, you're writing his story through your pen. No, not really. I mean, I think, you know, um, it's really, the, f the first part is really um, just about my attempt uh, to understand um, uh, the man, uh, my father, uh, and the leader that he was. Uh, I think that was important to me because I think you can't really tell uh, a story about me uh, without understanding uh, the legacy, uh, the towering legacy that I also uh, had to kind of carry or live under uh, for, 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 for my career. Um, and, uh, you know, it's also my own perspective uh, of it with, you know, uh, the benefit of 50 years uh, of hindsight uh, um, and, you know, my perspective of uh, his legacy. Uh, and uh, I think my perspective differs uh, slightly from many people. Uh, one of the key points I'd like to, I'd like to make uh, in this book was uh, the fact that I think uh, we, do, we Malaysians do ourselves uh, an injustice. Uh, by focusing too much on his tangible legacies, uh, like his policies and institutions that he built, uh, instead of focusing on uh, his values and his methods, which I think is more enduring and more relevant for future generations. The thing about the regular folk here is that tangibility is easy to point out, to emulate, to criticise. Intangible items like values is only felt through emotive action and perhaps even relationship. Mm -hmm. Many of us learn uh, through the legacy of Ton Raza through textbooks, not, you know, I mean, we don't have any access. How, how do you feel that some of his values need to be imparted, shared, told even, uh, to the many Malaysians out there? What would be some of his values that you think needs to be propagated even further today in the 21st century? Well, I, I list them in the book. You know, the book has um, uh, one chapter on his tangible uh, legacies, you know, his, the role he played in independence, the role he played in the formation of Malaysia, the role he played in education, rural development, uh, etc. 
Uh, that's uh, one section, one chapter of the book. And I put another chapter, uh, which are the intangibles, uh, his, um, his value system, uh, his methods. Uh, so I talk about how he was very much uh, a person who was, you know, he was a sort of, uh, he wasn't either or person. He, he combined things uh, that you might think are contradictory. Uh, like uh, the fact that he was consultative, yet bold. Uh, he consulted a lot, uh, but when he made his decision, uh, it could be very, very bold, uh, and he would be very aggressive in execution. Yeah, uh, he would like to take big steps and small steps. Um, um, and 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 one example is, you know, he loved. Uh, going uh, across the country, district by district, mm. to look at the rural development projects. Yeah, but sometimes he took huge leaps, like uh, going to China, right? Being the first Asian ASEAN leader to go to China uh, back in 1974, that was dramatic. And till today, you know, we 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 Malaysia benefit uh, from that, you know, um, uh, great leap leap of his. Uh, so so the you know I cover uh, a lot of uh, those those traits and uh, when I look at his value system, uh, he was an, uh, uh, definitely a nationalist, he was a democrat uh, and uh, when I look at um, Malaysia today, uh, I think uh, if you look at it from the value system as I understand it, I think you, you would see, even he would say today that those um, things that he did for the 1970s may no longer be relevant. Uh, he loved uh, evidence-based uh, decisions and the evidence points to the fact that the system uh, which he more than anyone else put in place needs to be recalibrated today. We'll take a pause for the moment before we continue on our conversation with Datuk Sri Naziraza. In so many ways, Dr. Nazir, um, I can easily draw parallels into some of the values that you shared just now about uh, Tun Raza, into how you have led your life um, during your captaincy of uh, CIMB Group. You took it from a small uh, merchant bank and grew it into uh, one of the largest uh, leading universal banks in ASEAN. You have led a consultative uh, method, but your methods are rather bold. I speak through this through experience, uh, uh, largely because I was part of that family <laughs> when you were there. And I do feel that some of the decisions that you made um, were very bold to a point where I'm pretty sure uh, some of the shareholders, some of your partners, uh, some of the leaders that served under you were quite nervous about some of the actions taken. But, you know, lo and behold, at the end of it all, the sum of it all, there was a positive, or an overwhelming positive net gain. Do you feel that that is the story that you want to write for yourself um, in trying to see uh, the growth of uh, Tun Raza? No, I think um, it was uh, uh, on hindsight uh, that I had the chance to kind of compare some of the things I did uh, and uh, uh, what he did. Uh, the methods I used and the methods uh, he used. And there were uh, some similarities and uh, I take it as a huge compliment that uh, you noted it. Um, I think that, um, for instance, when we went on this transformation journey of CIMB from an investment bank to Universal Bank, um, it was a bold move, but I think that you know, we did it because we analysed the situation and realised that our business model as an independent investment bank was not uh, going to uh, survive or be able to withstand uh, what was coming in terms of the operating environment. Yeah? So then we had to take that bold step, but not uh, before consulting, hev uh, consulting heavily and really thinking things through. Yeah? So, um, that's my own story. Mm -hmm. uh, I just look back and say, oh, okay, uh, there's some similarities. But, you know, of course, you know, he had a much uh, huger mm. uh, platform and it was a national platform, etc. I was just trying to build uh, a bank. <laughs> 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 At the end of it all, right? <laughs> um, one area that um, I must touch upon uh, is your relationship uh, with our former Premier, uh, Dr. Sri Najib Tun Razak. Um, Datuk Sri Najib uh, led the country for a number of years uh, to a point where uh, he suffered an unexpected, or some would say an expected loss uh, of the 2018 general elections. 
how is your relationship with Datuk Sri Najib currently? Um, is it warm? Is it cordial? Is it strained? What do you, what is going through uh, this brotherly love uh, between you and Datuk Najib? Oh, well, uh, we, you know, my father passed away when we were all very young. Uh, he was in his early 20s and I was nine. Um, and uh, uh, my mother kind of, you know, uh, held it all together. Uh, and I think because of that, uh, we, we, we were a pretty tight-knit uh, family. Yeah, so, uh, and we try very hard to keep it that way. Uh, and, you know, all of us have families, all of you have families, and uh, everybody knows that, you know, there are times when you have different uh, opinions, there are times when you quarrel. Um, but, you know, you, you always try and hold it together. Um, so, uh, over the years, uh, I think we've done, you know, we, 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 my mother did a very good job in keeping everybody together. Um, but, you know, as I tell uh, in the uh, book, um, my relationship with him went through a, a, a difficult time. Uh, particularly uh, because of 1MDB and um, you know um, uh, it started simply as my uh, belief uh, that there was this big financial scandal uh, at 1MDB uh, and trying um, to get him to uh, put a stop to it um, informing him that you know this is because I have no inside information mm. I get it from outside uh, but from what I could see uh, from a distance something wasn't quite right so I wanted him to do something about it, and you know, it, it, it progressed from there. Uh, and you know, uh, obviously he disagreed with me, and he wouldn't be the first leader to disagree with his brother. Uh, he disagreed with my view, and uh, uh, you know, uh, one thing led to another. Uh, and um, you know, I um, got to a point where it was a little bit binary, um, continuing down that path of uh, uh, opposing or, 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 or criticizing one MDB. Um, would actually, you know, uh, put him uh, in a difficult position. Uh, but I felt I needed to do it. Uh, so, of course, our relationship got a bit uncomfortable, but I still see him. Mm. Um, uh, I still you know, very much love him as uh, my brother, and I hope that, you know, uh, one day we can get back to the relationship we uh, had in the old days. The, this book is nothing else but the struggles of balancing your relationship as the son of Tun Raza, as the brother of Ratu Najib as a corporate captain, but also a person that is passionate about the nation, um, as a person that might not necessarily be in the know, but can get to the access that not many of us can. These many intersections of struggles uh, must tear you apart uh, the past decade. Is, is, that, is that something that I'm, I'm getting it right or absolutely wrong? Well, it, was, it was difficult. It was difficult. And you know, I used to come up and uh, speak out in public uh, about what I thought was 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 was, was not right, uh, and um, you know it was you get kind of caught in the middle, yeah. Uh, because some people will look at it and say, well, you know, is this guy real? You know, but he's he's an establishment guy. Why is he speaking up? Right? There must be a hidden agenda. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, is this them playing good cop, bad cop. I remember those kind of comments. It still uh, happens today, by the way. And it still happens today. And, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd also, um, uh, and interestingly, you know, people who opposed him also um, felt that, you know, I was also fair game, right? They would also come and attack me, yeah, just because I'm his brother. Um, so it was like, you know, sometimes people, you know, there's a saying, you know, you, you get caught in the middle of the road, you get run down by the bus. <laughs> uh, and sometimes I felt like that. You know. Multiple buses. <laughs> Multiple buses, yeah. Um, the, some of the excerpts that I wish to take from the book I include you um, wish that you could say more about 1MDB uh, during that time. Is that something that you think about often these days? No, I don't think I, I, I think what I said in the book was, you know, I, I, I felt um, sometimes I think back maybe I should have done more. Um, but I don't think it would have made a huge difference. Um, really? To, uh, to the, the, the whole uh, situation. Um, why I do you, know why do you feel that you know, I, I'm pretty sure that a lot of people will think otherwise. No, I don't think so. I mean, I said my piece um, in private and in, in, in public, uh, and I wasn't the only one. Um, other people were also saying their piece, and, 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 and there were investigations, uh, even in 2015, uh, around there, you know, they had the, the um, um, 
PAC and you had uh, the four tantries, uh, you remember, uh, those kind of investigations. Mm, and, yes. You know, uh, it was unsuccessful. Um, so uh, I do reflect whether more I could have done more, uh, probably not, uh, but you know, um, um, you know, I think it's something, it's the kind of emotions people go through when they look back on uh, something like that. The matter at hand is not just an individual holding the post of Prime Minister, it is actually the institution, as you rightfully pointed out. Uh, I, you have said it countless times, and now it's um, uh, immortalised in your book that Malaysia is grappling with uh, the three-headed monster that uh, we're identified, our issues are with identity politics, but I mean politics, uh, we're thinking too much in terms of power centralization. This, in my opinion, is a good step to resolving these issues because you have identified it and I don't hear anybody contesting that these are the three, <laughs> these are not the three problems, these are other three problems or some other issues. You would get uh, the feeling that a lot of people will agree that, yeah, this is, these three are the big issues that we need to resolve. Do you feel that uh, to find the answer shouldn't lie with just you and a book, but the, the answer is harder to be grappled with because you would need structural change to happen in this country, one that would perhaps change the fabric of the nation altogether? Well, absolutely. I mean, that's why I cover um, uh, in the, the, the last section. Uh, the way forwards, uh, uh, in my view, that this country has to take, uh, and you know, I think our um, path to the future uh, lies in our path, uh, which is this platform um, that Tunazak created in 1970, uh, where we brought um, you know 67 Malaysians of diverse background uh, to really sit down offline from Parliament to deliberate. You know, what is the way forward uh, for the nation? Uh, and uh, I think that's the only way. Uh, we can go into details why I think it's the only way, but uh, two things I'd point out is, one is many um, administrations uh, tried to reform, from Patla uh, to Najib to Mahade 2.0, they all started as reformists, but then they get hit by the reality of the political situation uh, and they can't move. Uh, two is, uh, across the world, uh, more and more, you see more and more of these so-called deliberative platforms uh, as uh, offline uh, platforms to deliberate structural reforms, right, and um, uh, working in tandem with Parliament. Uh, this is a way of, you know, democratic innovation, uh, if you like, strengthening democracy by having alternative platforms rather than just relying on Parliament. The problem with Parliament is, with respect, um, parliamentarians have their own political dynamics, uh, right, and it's very difficult for them to look beyond the election cycle very difficult for them to look at long-term structural issues uh, and they're always um, uh, dragged in by uh, what the gallery wants to hear uh, rather than being focused on uh, what the country truly needs uh, for the long term. The last time we spoke, uh, Dato, um, you were talking about, and the, the line still rings in my head, um, how many times have we seen good people enter politics and then they turn sour uh, or they turn into one of the normal uh, political animal that they are? Do you feel that, that that needs to change as well? Because essentially these are still people that we elect, these are still accountable to the people, and therefore we have to respect the democratic process as well, notwithstanding the deliberative uh, assembly that is working in tandem with... But I think part of the deliberative assembly is to uh, the aim of coming up with holistic uh, revamp of the system. Right? Uh, and when you look at holistic revamp, some of the elements uh, will be uh, looking at how we elect uh, our MPs, right? whether we use uh, the present type of first-past-the-post system or we go for something more proportional, uh, which is probably suited to, uh, better suited for a, a plural society uh, like ours. Yeah? Uh, it also should look at things like um, checks and balances between institutions uh, as a way of dealing uh, with money politics. Uh, and, you know, I'd like to think that some of those good people that I knew that went into politics uh, really didn't want to get into money politics, but had uh, those moments when you either play money in politics or you better retire, mm. right? And then they then say, okay, maybe I, I play a little bit money in politics because in the long end, when I get there, uh, I will be able to fix the nation. Uh, but of course, you know, it's a greasy, greasy pole. Uh, you have to do more and more of it in order to survive, then suddenly you kind of lose yourself. 
Uh, and this is why, you know, really to me, the only way is to have a holistic uh, reset of the system. We'll go for a short break. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Datuk Sri Nazirazak. Thanks for staying on. We continue with our conversation on the author of What's in a Name. Your uh, curriculum vitae um, is outstanding. Um, it is the uh, source of uh, inspiration for many business schools in this country. Uh, it is also, um, and I'm not trying to butter you up, this is indeed the case. Um, uh, and of course, this is a case study for all um, corporate Malaysians uh, trying to emulate. For better or worse, you make things happen. So when you started mooting this idea of a deliberative assembly, uh, creation of a better Malaysia, if anybody can do it, it's somebody like you, uh, Dato Sri. What would be some of the challenges that you foresee is going to uh, uh, slow down this process of the creation of such an assembly? No, I need buy-in. Uh, I need uh, supporters, uh, people who... Uh, also uh, call for this um, derivative platform uh, and I need buy-in uh, from the people that can truly make it happen right uh, I think you know uh, it should be done uh, by Parliament or should be done by the executive or done by the rulers council uh, the most important thing is you know uh, uh, it gets done uh, but you know people in those positions uh, need to respond positively uh, to our calls and I think you know uh, the law of politics if uh, the, the noise is loud enough, uh, they will listen. Mm. There is also that element of a, a feeling of something that can be fixed even though it's not traditional for it to be fixed. One area of um, uh, interest for me is the Malay rural heartland, an area that Allah um, Yerahantun Raza only knows very well, an area that holds so much political power in terms of the ability for them to determine who goes into the parliament. Is this a demography that requires such a buy-in, uh, Dato' Sri? For sure. I mean, in the end of the day, Malays today account for, uh, Boom Putras account for two-thirds of the population and growing. Yeah, uh, that is uh, uh, the core uh, of, of the voters. Uh, I think we need to engage uh, the Malays and uh, we need to show leadership uh, and we need to articulate a more positive vision of the nation uh, that includes uh, the non malays yeah? that is more inclusive, uh, more collaborative, uh, rather than uh, being uh, divisive. Right? Uh, and, and you know, I articulate in the book, uh, there is a chapter called Malaysia Renewed. Mm. Uh, and I'd like people to read that and sort of think, OK, uh, we could be uh, a country like that. Uh, and if they buy that Malaysia Renewed that I described, they want that Malaysia Renewed I described, then maybe uh, they should buy in uh, to this idea of setting up the deliberative platform so we can design the path uh, to that better Malaysia. One buy in that is also quite important to think about, and you rightly pointed out, would be the involvement of royals to some degree at least. Um, how, how would you approach this very tricky issue um, where their role is enshrined the constitution, but their buy in is not only needed but greatly sought after? Well, I think it's interesting because I think the, you know, we have the most democratic monarchy in the world, <laughs> right? Mm. Uh, and uh, some people uh, have criticised me for saying that, you know, maybe the rulers uh, should play a bigger role. Um, and uh, interestingly, when they criticise that idea, uh, they don't have an alternative institution uh, to offer. I mean, one of the issues I, I argue is that, um, um, you know, political competition in Malaysia today is not properly... Uh, regulated. There's no proper referee, right, for whatever reason. Uh, and we're so lucky uh, to have this democratic institution that's deeply embedded in our culture. Uh, so why not uh, uh, ask the monarchy to play a bigger role in terms of refereeing political competition? Uh, because today, things like um, um, MACC and uh, Election uh, Commission, uh, they report to uh, the PM, uh, in effect. Uh, and even when they went, uh, report to Parliament, uh, if the ruling party is dominant in parliament, in effect, they report to the PM. 
Uh, and I think it's fairer uh, if you know, uh, they are truly independent. Uh, and one way to give the independence uh, is to have uh, them um, uh, under the um, rulers' council. Uh, it's just an idea. Uh, and Brian, this is the thing about this deliberative platform. I can mm. throw ideas, mm. but I'm not it's suggesting... It's not a rule book, it's not a playbook. It's not a playbook. I'm not suggesting a playbook. I think we need to get our best, brightest, and also some ordinary. Right? There's some deliberative platforms in the world where you know, people are just uh, selected uh, by sortition mm. uh, at random. Uh, so I think we should have our best, brightest, and also some randomly selected Malaysians on this uh, deliberative platform. We call it a national assembly. I call it better Malaysia assembly, but you could also call it just a citizen's assembly, uh, for instance. And we sit down offline, 18 months uh, to, to, to two years, really, you know, every day, just brainstorm uh, a better Malaysia, right? And then come up with recommendations to parliament uh, to say that, look, you know, these are the uh, legislative changes uh, and policy changes that you must implement uh, because we need to reset the nation. How has the buy-in been from the lawmakers? Have you been speaking to some of them, a lot of them? Uh, I do. Uh, I think in general, um, the intelligentsia are very much in favour of this idea. Um, I think the lawmakers still in general feel uh, that you know, uh, this is something they can do uh, through parliamentary select committees, uh, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, I don't agree, uh, um, but, you know, and it, but it's something that uh, I need to continue to pursue. The buy-in from the political parties per se, is there one in favour of the other, or you uh, are appealing to a certain particular side more than the no, other? No, no. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm apolitical. I'm putting this idea out there and I welcome any or every political party uh, to run with this. You know, mm. And I keep telling people, you know, I am not a politician. Right? Uh, I'm putting out an idea uh, uh, in terms of how to improve our politics uh, and I'm inviting anyone uh, to, to run with it. Moving away from the 300 monster, or the so-called 300 monster, moving away from the better Malaysia political, uh, sorry, uh, consultative assembly, um, one idea that attracted me uh, a lot uh, in skimming through the book, pardon me for not completing the book in time, uh, but uh, is the issue of power centralization within the role of the Prime Minister. You were alluding to some of the elements to it. Everything goes back to the Prime Minister. This is uh, an action that has been in design for the past few decades, um, over the past few Prime Ministers. And, and the nature of power is that while it corrupts, it also is impossible or quite difficult to take away from, unless one willingly abdicates, um, which is very rare when it comes to power as big or as powerful as a prime minister. Do you feel that uh, uh, the nation is aware that such power centralization is to our own detriment and that we have to be louder? in trying to talk about this at least, a lot more frequent, in a lot more public fora. Is that an idea that you're thinking about right now? Well, I think in the overall context of reducing concentration of power and the fact that one of the shortcomings of the system uh, is the fact that we had uh, one person uh, had too much power, um, I think is, is compelling. Uh, I think it's obvious, uh, but I wouldn't say uh, enough people see it as a problem. I mean, even you look at the recent surveys on democracy across the world, strangely, um, there's, you know, in many countries, people are so frustrated uh, with politics that they also say, oh, let's just have authoritarian governments. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, but, uh, you know, I want to convince people uh, that Malaysia's problem uh, is, is not about uh, 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 the centre not having enough power, it's about centre having too much power. Right. We need to defray that power. We need to have proper checks and more checks and balances uh, so that better decisions are made. And that's why I go back to the Tun Razak legacy when he chose uh, to um, give back power to parliament. Um, I remember, uh, you know, I, and I've been reading, talking to a lot of people, um, he, was a he had dictatorial powers um, as uh, the director of uh, uh, the National Operations Council. He was the dictator. Uh, and when he wanted to bring back parliament, there were many people around him who said, don't bother, let's just 
you know, run this country, we'll make this a great country. And you look around the region at that time, you know, Myanmar, uh, um, uh, even uh, uh, Indonesia and all that, they were, you know, all run by strong men. And they were like saying, why bother? Uh, but he, he was a true Democrat and he, he, I quote him there saying, you know, if you really want to do good, too much power is no good. Uh, those were Tun Razak's words. Uh, and I always remember that. And I, I actually, to be honest, you know, take, I don't want to draw too much parallels, but I also felt uh, that, uh, you know, I remember one of the reasons I stepped down from being CEO of CIMB was I felt that having been there for so long, uh, I had become too powerful. Mm. Uh, and I felt there wasn't enough checks and balances on me. Uh, as well, uh, which is why, you know, I, 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 uh, in part, I stepped down in 2014. In your final AMD, that um, uh, normal business schools uh, point out that effective CEOs are about five years, um, and uh, you're there for 14 years as a uh, group CEO, and, uh, you know, more, you certainly overshot that by a mile. I don't know whether you remember giving this particular... Speech. I remember the, the, the point, yeah. I'm amazed you remember. <laughs> But like I said, if, if you have wisdom to abdicate, you would do it. Dato Sri Najib, for instance, did not see that. And in fact, uh, even after the election, uh, he was uh, not clear-cut in um, uh, uh, giving that consolation announcement. How, how was... How was that evening for you, for going back to uh, that day on 2018? It was a night of conflicting emotions. Um, you know, at that time, I, did, I was concerned that if uh, uh, BN won again, uh, we would, um, you know, they would be too tempted to kind of, you know, bury the 1MDB uh, problem. Uh, and you know, bear, sometimes when you try to bury something like that, it could be very costly, right? Uh, so I was worried about that. Um, and so when uh, the election results came out, uh, I could see, you know, a positive in that score, uh, obviously. Uh, and I felt that, you know, reading the PH manifesto, um, it was exciting to think that, you know, this could be a truly reforming government and we could get a better Malaysia out of it. Uh, that's how I felt on the one side. Uh, on the other side, of course, uh, my brother, uh, who uh, was Prime Minister, uh, was going to have to uh, step down. Uh, and it was very painful uh, to, see, um, to see him uh, face uh, that moment. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, we're family uh, still, so it was conflicting. It's that, it's that, I don't know whether, I mean, uh, please don't be uh, upset with me, but uh, the Raza family is like the Kennedys. You're a family, but a rather public one. For better or worse, whatever you do uh, will be reflected upon, not just on the nation, but as your family as well. And you were talking about being fair game. You're talking about people attacking you or your brother, one or another. I remember the days when CMB got good mandates and, and there were accusations that, ah, oh, you know, CMB only got it because somebody in Putrajaya is in your, in your side, in your corner. How do, you, how do you navigate this very, I guess, nagging, persistent, <laughs> irritating kind of noise? I'm sure it gets to you eventually, right? Well, yeah, I mean, but, you know, uh, it started very soon after I came back from the UK. You know, I realised that, you know, um, I... You know, when people say, you know, um, um, first impressions matter, mm. right? I never give first impressions. I only work on second impressions because people always have a first impression of me uh, based on what they think of my family, what they think of my father, what they think of my brother, whichever, right? And they, you know, every time I meet someone, I already can read that he has an impression of me. Uh, so then uh, it was about trying to um, convince uh, him uh, or her um, you know, that, that impression may be wrong and this is the true me. Mm. Right? That's been um, a, a fact of my life mm. uh, all along. And then, you know, uh, the other element of it, when people say uh, you are there by virtue of, you know, uh, who you are and so on and so forth, you know, I, I, I gave up worrying about that for so long uh, because, you know, it's an impossible situation. Uh, and, you know, I think I just, you know, 
um, do my best because I think you know this kind of strong brand is double-edged and people should know that. I mean, I, I recount in there how when I applied to CIMB uh, first time, I was rejected uh, because my interviewer, um, uh, who became my good friend, my, my interviewer rejected me. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I said, why? And he gave me some excuse then about me, me not having an accounting qualification or something. Mm -hmm. But many years later, he said, I, I rejected you because I, 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 I didn't believe that given your background, you'd be able to work the kind of hours we needed at CIMB. You know, uh, and so my first few years, uh, I was really battling uh, that uh, uh, stereotype, right? Uh, that this guy had uh, born with a, uh, a silver spoon, so therefore cannot work hard. So I worked very, very hard uh, to dis disprove that. Uh, and then I continued to always have that in my back of my mind. And I always have to excel uh, because people always think that, you know, uh, I don't deserve what I have. Uh, and then after a while, I said, ah, uh, I'll just do my best and, you know, um, uh, let people judge me uh, or not judge me. Well, people do judge you, uh, <laughs> but not for the wrong reasons. I can tell you that. People do look at your car, Jalan Semantan, being parked that first car in, last <laughs> car out for how many years? Um, young folks like me do look at that as a signal that this guy is is not there because of you know the legacy of his father or what. You yeah. really work your ass off. I mean, because you, the, the, the you French, were there, but, you saw it. But you know, I've been to public forums and people have you know, stood up and, and abused me and said, look, you know, uh, why are you here? You're only there because of, you know, your brother or your father or something, you know. Mm. Uh, but, you know, I, I mean, I can't, you know, I can't ask people to be sorry for me. You can't, you know, it's wrong. You know, I, 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 I have a lot of advantages. Uh, is that the value that you bring to the book? That you're going to write as per what you think is the truth and therefore, however bitter it must taste, it's out there in the open right now, even though it might I guess, jeopardize your relationship with whoever? No, I mean, I think, you know, uh, one starts with the desire to uh, write the memoir and contribute to the discourse uh, for a better Malaysia, um, help future generations learn from you know, the good things I did and the bad things I did. Um, and once you've fixed your mind on doing that, um, you have to do it uh, as truthfully uh, and as openly as possible. Uh, a lot of a lot of then, people are saying that Tun Musa is saying that um, um, yeah. so many other um, Datuk Kalimullah was writing in his uh, rather very public LinkedIn post, but uh, but they're all saying that thing. The truth is now coming out, and therefore it is liberating. Falling back to my first question to you just now, yeah, I mean, Datuk Sri, yeah. we are looking at an orchestra. We're looking at the crescendo after a very tension kind of note, musical note. Do you feel that this is the crescendo that we're looking at, the resolution of the story of not just the legacy of Tun Raza, the legacy of Datuk Sri Najib, and quite frankly, the legacy of Datuk Sri Nazir as well. Do you feel that this is on to the solution and the resolution of all uh, the issues that we've been facing through for the past five decades? Well, I hope this book contributes to that. Uh, I don't know. Uh, we will see. Uh, but I think it adds to the, the, the work I've been doing and many people have been doing uh, to kind of say, look, uh, there's something uh, fundamentally wrong uh, with the system today. Uh, and I hope that, you know, people read the book and sort of say, yeah, actually, this makes sense. I want to um, be part of the call uh, for a national reset. Uh, and you know, let's see where we go. The book is, of course, out on November 8th. Um, if people want to find out where to find the book, how do they go about it? It should be in most bookstores, inshallah. We've got to think about e-book, Dato' Sri. E-book. E-book is coming. Yeah, e-book is coming and the Basa version is coming. Because COP26, you know, we're trying to save the trees <laughs> as well. Uh, it has been a great privilege speaking to you. Uh, it's an honour. I probably uh, wouldn't be able to trade this off for another kind of interview. This is a rather frank and honest conversation. Um, I really thank you uh, very much from the bottom of my heart because, like I said, the term I'd always use is inside baseball. You kind of know the things inside um, and, and, and the struggles that you go through. Um, but I'm pretty sure the naysayers are still going to be um, rattling uh, the empty cans uh, at the side of the street. Uh, thank you very much. You do inspire a lot of us. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for having me. That was our conversation with Datuk Sri Nazir Raza. If you've missed any part of this interview, just head on to astroawani.com and look for What's in a Name or Nazir Raza. Until then, thanks very much for watching and goodbye.